Greetings, everyone. I hope you're keeping safe. And please stay at home if there's nothing you have to go and do out of your home. Ensure you keep social distance as we try to see how the situation goes with this COVID-19. Welcome to this class, and today I want to take us through an overview of play therapy in children. Again, this is just an overview. Otherwise, play therapy is a very technical therapy that requires much time, requires a lot of training, but I just want to give you a brief overview of it and how this entails so that you can now, if you make up your mind in the interest of play therapy, we'll definitely need to do more training in this area so that we can have the nitty gritty of how to use the, this therapy. So today we want to look at specifically play therapy and this is an overview. Now, what is play therapy? When we talk about play therapy, we just mean that uh, this is whereby you as a clinician engages child in a play so that you use it as a therapeutic method to help a child or cope up with whatever they are going through. Basically, you want to diagnose what the child is having so that you can be able to know how to treat, but also you want to assist the child try to deal with these emotional issues that they are having. A lot of children are unable to deal with issues and they, can't, they may not be able to talk to you and tell you what they're going through. But through this expressive method, such as play therapy and art therapy, children are able to deal with these emotions appropriately. And not just that, they can now be able to engage you through what they are going through as you take them through the play therapy. So it is a, it's actually a very important uh, or appropriate strategy or approach in helping younger children who are unable to talk, who are unable to deal with, uh, with their issues in terms of how to express themselves cognitively. Because in other sessions you've seen there's a very huge difference between a child and an adult. Cognitively, in terms of dependence, inter interdependence, in terms of emotional uh, expressions, etc. So it's important that we use a medium that is easily available for a child to express themselves and deal with the issues that they are facing through. And I say that they are, when, they, when children play, they play out their feelings and their problems, just as it would have happened to an adult, explaining to you how they feel or expressing their feelings and emotions to you. Now, usually who can actually use play therapy? Um, as I said, this is a very technical uh, uh, therapy and requires a lot of training in it so that you can know exactly on how to diagnose, how to pick issues when a child is playing and how to relate with them uh, as per your clinical intake that you've been able to uh, uh, take with, with the child and, and the guardian. However, play therapy can be used with any child who is having any psychological problem, whether parental conflict, whether separation or divorce, whether trauma, whether sexual abuse, whether emotional abuse or any other abuse, whether they're in ad adopted or in foster, whether, they are, whether they, they are in grief, whether they have been hospitalized, whether there's, so basically all mental disorders affecting children can easily be taken care of with the play therapy. So it is a very, very good medium of being able to diagnose and rehabilitate children with uh, uh, psychological problems. Let's look at some of the materials that you need when you are using play therapy. One of them is usually manipulative materials such as clay and crayons. You can use them. And you know, these materials are just easily available. Don't think about these, going to a toy shop and buying this expensive. You know, just go for these materials that children used to play, available to you in your environment as a therapist. Water and containers, sand, toy kitchen appliances, utensils, baby items, dolls of different sizes by you know, different genders and different sizes and ages, toy cars, animals, blocks, many. And even the child, you can also bring in some of the, their own items if that is so. Again, if you're doing this in a clinical setup in a therapeutic center, this is important. Sometimes we do um, uh, uh, make home arrangements where you're doing the play therapy within a home setup, but make up almost like a clinical play therapy setup so that you make, you ensure that all the issues pertaining a therapeutic relationship such as privacy and confidentiality are also taken care of. So after looking at these materials, it's also important for us to look at structures of play. And we have four structures of play. 
We have what we call the sensory play. We have what we call the functional play, which we are going to explain. We have what we call the symbolic play. Again, I'll be able to explain. We have what we have, we call the complex play. Let's look at sensory motor play. As from the word in, in, in the way to describe this, this is where a child explores and experiences the world through the senses. So what we mean is that it includes all activities that stimulate the young child's senses, the touch, the taste, the smell, the movement, the balance, the sight and hearing, any, any activity that is going to stimulate that. For example, if a child may find it difficult to play appropriately with a peer when they are in another environment or something and they, they don't like, for example, noise, you might want to stimulate this sense of that by exploring sounds and tasks the child learns to adapt to be able to block out noise, which is not important and focus on the play which is occurring with their peer. So you just want to bring in what activity can you bring in that helps a child to adopt or adapt to the situations of noise and be able to block it and still pursue whatever they want. And out of this, they can also, also narrate. They could tell you this is too noisy and then they can now, you can now set a narrating and explaining how to be able to block when there's another noise and you can still do activity. Another structure of play is functional play. We call sometimes projective play and there's a lot of games and rules. And here a child just wants to discover the external world by exploring materials external to him. So we could actually say that um, functional play is like a fast play. And, and of course a child will use something to detain themselves. Like for example, a functional play could include opening and closing things, throwing things, stacking blocks, knocking them down, pushing a toy here and there, banging objects, etc. So here the child is just trying to explore the world outside him. Like when they kick or they are able to bang uh, 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 they, they're able to bang objects together, what happens? When they stack blocks together, what happens? Can they, restack, uh, can they remake them and take, take them back? You know, so basically, can they close and open? They're trying just to, 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 to look at it and see how you also react with what you say about that and etc. We have what we call symbolic play, and here mostly there's a little pretense with complexity, they can pretend with their own body on objects etc. When a child uses objects to stand in for other objects, simply that, they use, you know, for a phone, it could mean a human being. It, for, for something like um, uh, um, a banana could actually mean a phone. So they take a banana and say, hey dad, how are you? That's standing in for a phone. So an empty cereal bowl could actually stand in for, say for example, a car. So basically, they use this kind of place very symbolic and it's very important in terms of development, both academically, socially, and amongst other areas. So, it, you know, in symbolic pro, uh, play, a child will take other objects to stand in for others. A doll is for stands in for a mother. Um, you know, uh, um, a small doll will stand in for a child. A male doll will stand in for a, a father. That's what you call symbolic. And they will definitely uh, use these uh, objects in that, in the symbolic representation of the child. So it's something you want to talk, take note of. Then we have complex symbolic play. A child plans and acts out dramatic play sequences. They use imagery objects, incorporate others into the play with assigned roles. They imitate, take turns, and solve problems. So he would actually take a male doll, a female doll, a baby doll, take up uh, utensils in the kitchen and play out different roles in all these, the mother speaking to the, the father, a father speaking to a child, a child calling out the house, help, you know, a car, a father driving at a car. So they act and dramatize in sequence using the imaginary objects that you have provided for them and assign roles and imitate so that if it's a, it's a policeman is shooting, if it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a criminal probably uh, their handcuffs here and there. So basically they use that and that's what you call complex play because it's able to put people in different situation using the objects in terms of interpreting his world and make it out so clearly 
and enacting it as, as if it is in the real world. So very, very important. And all these structures are important for any clinician to take note of, depending on the age of the child, depending on the situation of the child, depending on the stage of the problem amongst many, many, many others. So how do you start a play? First of all, a clinical intake is very important with the child and health and, and the, the caregiver because here you want to look at all the information regarding the child and taking it a lot, complete history taking, bio data, uh, uh, family history, social history, developmental history, interpersonal history, medical history, previous treatment history, sexual history, drug abuse history, uh, if uh, marital problems with history, if they are available, if they are there. And of course, even the mental state examination of the child. So you want to ensure you have a complete history taken so that when you do this, you have, you when the child is playing, you're relating with the information you have. And based on this information, then it is easier to know whether you want to do a directive or a directive approach depending on the situation, depending on the child, depending on the structure that you want to have. So I would say that every play is structured on the child's needs and it is used a professional to be able to pick up and know what fits or what suits that child for that purpose. So the needs of a child are very important and no structure of the play or whatever it is will always be the same for every child. It is you based on the information that you have that you will know which is the best that modality in terms of helping your child. So they are going to be different. The good thing about play is, as I said earlier, it's about both a diagnostic and a rehabilitative uh, um, approach to treatment of children issues. So, so, when, so before you start in calling tech so that you can determine your way forward. The second thing is about the room and how you're going to structure the room and the session. So make sure that the atmosphere in which the child is, they are able to know it and they're able to express themselves well. You're not going to close a child in a very tiny small room. You create anxiety. You're not going to put a child in a place that they get us so scared and no. Allow space, allow room. And even the way the room is, the way it has been painted, the way what is available on the wall, this is really important. So you just want to ensure that the atmosphere is conducive for play. Then as a child is playing with the material of their choice, you have to be observant. Please give unconditional positive regard empathize wherever you need to have to show empathetic responses you see people always ask me so now how do you empathize when a child is playing look a child has this toy of a dad and in another hand they have a toy representing their mother and there's a small toy there again that they are observing looking like representing the child of course and then there is a fight between the two so the child imagines to be the father and says, I'm going to kill you. I'll kill you. And the mother says, don't kill me. Don't do this. And now that's already something. I want to empathize with the child and look at the child and say, wow. I imagine how this child, the other toy that is available, this little child who is watching this fight. I wonder how they feel. And the child will say, well, they were so scared, they were afraid or whatever. That's actually getting into the child's world because then there's this fight and there's that toy. You are not saying, you're not pointing to the child and tell the child, I wonder how you felt when your parents were fighting. No, you're actually pointing on the other toy who you know as a profession that represents the child, now your client, and wonder how, and you want to refer to that toy and say, tell me how this so, I mean, how this, this baby felt when the two were fighting. And then that way, the child is able to know your empath, and then you can now explore the feelings and ETC. So it's important that you look at that. And then we're saying that through the session, the therapist must give unconditional, accepting anything the child might do or say. You are not correcting the child. 
You are not the change the, the mind of the child. You are just there to observe, to be there emotionally, and also be there to empathize, to offer support, etc. Let the child do whatever they want to do, and let them do the way they want to do in their own way. Never express shock or argue or tease or moralize or tell the child mm, that's not right oh come on this is not you this is the child this is his world or her world so let the child just be who they are don't correct you are erasing so much about the child when you correct and i don't know what you're correcting by the way you just correct it you might be correcting your own world and not the child's world so you don't want to actually do that so try your best and not do that now how do you gain insights um, into the child's problems? One is always you can observe if there's any aggressiveness. Are they hurting each other or self? Are there issues of anxieties? Is there any shyness, emotions such as anger, sadness, fear? Are there any regressions, low self-esteem, sexual behavior? My point is that you look for everything that you know you are looking for. You have a clinical intake, you know your child, you know what you're looking for, you want to see if the child is bringing out what you have or whatever you don't have, and you want just to compare, you know, so that you make the right diagnosis and know how to help the child. Why play therapy? One, every child is unique. And play therapy gives them an opportunity to be able to do so naturally, and it's safe and also enables healing. Secondly, children who have traumatic events or any behavioral problems, this would be the best way to express them. And of course, it is also healthy in terms of self-care skills where a child is able to take care of themselves and of course learn more of what is happening around them. Also, it reduces anxiety or any trauma. It helps the child express their own feelings it promotes self-confidence and a sense of competence, helps the child trust themselves and others. And of course, with, the, with, your, with your facilitation, it helps define health boundary and of course, enhance healthy bonding relationships. It also brings in a lot of creativity on the child's side and playfulness and also promotes appropriate behavior. And during this, it, it brings in communication. You're able to communicate the child and understand their world as you observe and partake the play therapy. So in conclusion, play, whether verbal or symbolic, functional or complex, and problem solving roughly helps the, you to assess a child's cognitive level in terms of their developmental intactiveness, in terms of delays, or proxy. However, it's also important to know that play is important in helping a child deal with their problems. It's, still, it's, it's, it's also a di diagnostic as well as a rehabilitative measure of any therapist in terms of helping a child deal with their psychological problems. Thank you so much. You are most welcome in terms of asking any questions. Please comment on my YouTube and ask me if you have any question I'm able to respond. Thank you. Bye.